but when you walked in that dressing room, then you were you were brothers. And, and whenever we'd play teams that you had a brother on, you talked to them the night before, but you didn't talk to them again until after the game. And it was because you were in the dressing room with your brothers, so to speak. And that, that's, that's the demeanor we had internally with the Islander team. At the end of the day, it was just the belief we had in each other and, and, and the trust we had in each other. And, and you knew the guy beside you in the dressing room had your back all the time. That was Dwayne Sutter, four-time Stanley Cup champion as a member of one of hockey's greatest ever teams, the New York Islanders. And you are listening to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Pudol. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Podolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Podolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for a thousand. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello there and welcome back to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padol. And you are here for episode 100, the century mark of the Up My Hockey podcast. Um, kind of crazy even to like reflect a little bit on what 100 means. I know it's just a number, but it, uh, it does mean that we've been at this thing for quite a while now. And uh, I'm proud to say that we're still here after 100 episodes and uh, definitely been contemplating on how to uh, address the, the 100 mark, you know, the 100 episodes. And, and I think I will probably uh, do my own personal reflection uh, on, on the episodes and, and maybe my, my most memorable conversations and maybe point out why, why they were special to me and, and maybe for some of you newer listeners might give you a little bit of direction to look backwards. Uh, I definitely suggest catching up. Yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll see the growth of the podcast and, and, uh, just in the, in the discussions, but there are some amazing, amazing guests, um, from back to three years ago. And as you know, if you have listened to any of the episodes, uh, that the, the conversations are as relevant today as they were when they were had two or three years ago, you know, the, the lessons and the, and the, uh, and the gold nuggets of inspiration or motivation are, are, are still there. So I, I do believe that I'm going to be looking backwards and, uh, and reflecting on, on the past, you know, two and a half, three years or whatever it's been since I started this. I, I'm not a guy that's good with dates, but, uh, but boy, 100 is, uh, is the century mark. And, and for today on the century mark, we, we really couldn't have a better guest, uh, a former coach of mine with the Florida Panthers. He was an assistant coach there in, in 1996 and 1997, uh, Mr. Dwayne Sutter, who, who himself was an outstanding player, you know, 730 games in the NHL. He was a 17th overall draft pick to the New York Islanders, uh, went straight from junior hockey to the big show, and uh, and never looked back. He never played a, a, a day in the AHL, and uh, and boy, what a team did he step into there! It was it was a team that had success the previous season, uh, but didn't quite get to where they wanted to get to. And then uh, Dwayne showed up uh, on the scene along with some others, and uh, and the New York Islanders went on to win 19 consecutive playoff series, meaning four consecutive Stanley Cups and a final finals appearance in the fifth fifth crack at it and uh <clears throat> excuse me and Dwayne was there for it all uh as far as the Sutter name you know the, the Sutter name back when I was growing up was was super relevant uh because they were all in the NHL there was six brothers in the NHL at the same time which is unfathomable really I mean the closest thing we have now will be the Hughes brothers it looks like there'll probably be three of them in the NHL at the same time and, and I mean what a feat that is for for one family but for a family from Viking Alberta you know whatever the population is there but we're talking four digits not five um, for six of the seven brothers to play and footnote on that apparently the seventh brother which we cover here in this interview might have been the best player of them all he was the oldest and just chose to stay on the farm 
So six out of seven could have been seven out of seven playing the NHL is is really almost incomprehensible. Um, and they were all, I mean, they were all top picks except for one. The, the combined Sutter family ended up playing close to 5,000 games in the NHL. Uh, many went on to GM positions or to coaching positions like Dwayne did. So um, I wanted to revisit that because for me, being 47 years old, uh, we knew the Sutters, and I know the Sutters, but for some of these younger players now, I mean, they might know they might know Daryl, you know, who's the head coach in uh, in Calgary, and and uh, that might be a name that's relevant because he's obviously still relevant. But uh, it's tough to look back and know all all of the history of the game. So I thought this would be an amazing opportunity to to celebrate the Sutters again, to talk about their upbringing and their story, and and uh, and what the the secret recipe was for their success as a family to to show up at the NHL level and to be as successful as they were. Um, Dwayne, getting back to Dwayne on a, on a personal level, uh, just a, a super gentleman. You know, he's, uh, he's soft-spoken, um, but he was, he was tough when he needed to be, especially on the ice, you know, but I was just, I knew him more in the coaching capacity and he was always someone to put, put his arm around you. He was also someone that would kick you in the butt, um, but he would never, ever, you know, flash his credentials or throw his resume in your face. You know, I mean, he kept quiet about about his his. Uh, I mean, all the great things that he accomplished in his career, and, and he he just let uh, let players come to them, and and he would he would approach them as as he felt that they they needed to be approached, and and I think that his personality comes through in in this interview. Uh, we talk about how we came in contact again, and that was in the, at an Islanders alumni weekend, and and shout out to the New York Islanders. Uh, what a fantastic ownership group there since they've taken over. They've really embraced the history of what the Islanders are and, you know, and, and all the, you know, all the things that they've accomplished. And, and one of the things that they've said is whether you've played one game or, or a thousand games, uh, you're a part of the Islander family. And, and they're one of the few teams in the NHL that I know of, maybe the only one that has an annual alumni weekend where if you played a game for them, you are invited to show up in New York and they're going to take care of you for essentially 48 hours. And uh, they take you to a game and into the suite and, you know, red carpet rolls out and uh, they just absolutely celebrate the history of, of the team. And, and it gives all us old guys an opportunity to tell stories and, you know, get together. And I'm joking about me being an old guy, but there's the guys there that are much older than me that are that played back in the 70s. And and uh, it's really awesome to have all those generations cross uh, cross paths in one spot and one special weekend of the year. So that's where Dwayne and I got into contact with each other again. And Dwayne, like I said, the gentleman that he was, I had my my middle son there with me. It's kind of a family trip that that we've planned all the time. We we take one of our boys uh, each year has been the plan. And and uh, so Dwayne took took the time. You know, in front of my and my son to introduce himself and and to and to say to Gunner, you know, that I was a really special player and that I he should be really proud of his dad and, and that I just didn't get an opportunity and and I'm just sharing that with you here is just because one it was it was nice to hear from me, but it was also just super gracious of him to take the time to say that to to my 12 year old son, who I'm sure it's going to be an impactful comment for him for years. So, um, I think that just speaks to, to who he is and what he's all about to kind of understand, you know, that side of the game. And, um, and you know what I'm all about here at my hockey, it really is about developing, you know, the holistic idea of the player and, and really shining a light on, on the interpersonal skills and, and the way to be, around people right to be able to have an impact on people uh to not only like just show up the way you should show up whether it be to a practice or to a tryout or or in a team environment but even outside of the rink like for mr Dwayne sutter in a hotel lobby to take the time to introduce himself to a 12 year old boy and to say something as kind as he did um to him so uh, kudos to Dwayne. Uh, he, he really, his, I think his character and his personality shines through here in this interview. And, um, you know, another thing, I mean, I, I texted him the day before. I said, hey, I, I, you know, I need a guest for Thursday. Would you, would you like to come on? And, you know, he jumped right on. Yeah, afternoon would be great. So, you know, just really easy to get in hold of. Was really willing to, to, uh, to help me out and to, and to come on the podcast. So, uh, Dwayne, if you are listening, uh, thanks so much for, for being a part of it. I really do appreciate your time. And I know that, 
your story uh, is definitely worth telling and and worth celebrating. So for those of you listening right now, uh, you're in for a treat for episode 100. Uh, couldn't have a better name uh, to to headline the 100th episode. Uh, my former coach and a player of 731 regular season games and another 161 playoff games in the winner of four Stanley Cups, uh, Mr. Dwayne Sutter. Enjoy the conversation. Here we are uh, with my old coach of my first NHL team and a four-time cup champion himself uh, and been around the game forever, Mr. Dwayne Sutter. Thank you so much for being here on Up My Hockey. Thank you, boss. Great, great to visit with you. Yeah, I was um, just for those that don't know, and uh, and I might have mentioned it in the intro, but we we just came across paths again at the Islanders alumni weekend. And uh, and it was awesome just to see not only Dwayne, but, you know, legends from the past and uh, players that I played with before and, and just in an environment that kind of makes you feel like an NHL again, doesn't it, Dwayne? It's pretty awesome the way they put that on there. You know what? It was all first class and, and a great credit to the ownership of the Islanders. What they've done since they bought the team a few years ago is simply re- remarkable. They're bringing their alumni back in the group and, and uh, just just the memories that, that come up and, and the people that you cross paths with that, that uh, were important, important people of, of the of the journey. So it, it was simply remarkable and, and uh, n- nice to see you guys again, too. Yeah, no, it's, it's so fun. And I, I love bringing the different generations together, you know, like it's uh, having those conversations with guys that you never played with from different eras. I think there's there's value there for sure. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's something that I really enjoyed, really special event for 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 my family uh, to put that on the calendar and to come up. And and the funny like the irony is, is uh, which I'm sure you saw, but the listeners didn't. So we got jerseys this year, like the, every year they give you something, something different. And this year we all got our own Jersey with our number on it and, and our name and, and embroidered on the sleeve was how many games you played with the, uh, with the Islanders. And yeah. so anyways, I was talking with, with Trotche there at one point, I think he mean he had 1100 games or something with the Islanders essentially his whole career. And, and I looked down on my sleeve and I had one. <laughs> <laughs> so it was my last game ever in the NHL and it was one game with the Islanders, but that's, that's like how special it is for them because they say, I mean, that is actually kind of the slogan, whether you played one game or a thousand games, you're a part of, you're a part of the Islanders family. And they really did treat us all one and the same. Yeah. And you had some really special seats right down at ice level behind the goalie. Awesome. Yeah, that was super cool. They, uh, they brought my wife and I down and my, and my son, who was a goalie, uh, and who has the who had the the jersey the Sorokin jersey on right behind Sorokin like six feet away so that was really cool to watch a period yeah. from, from that perspective. Yeah. Always uh, fun to, so, to see how your kids respond to something like that. Yeah, exactly. It was totally fun. So, anyways, this is episode 100, though. By the way, Dwayne, I never told you that. So this is a uh, hundred episodes. You're you are my century mark, and and what a cool guest for uh, to have on. So thanks so much for awesome. for being here, and and uh, yeah, kind of a a landmark episode for, for the podcast. It's been going since pre COVID and kind of stops and starts here and there, but I've definitely been uh, more, more consistent and more dedicated to it. It's, it's been a great platform and we gained a lot of, a uh, lot of great, great responses just by how it's kind of made a difference in people's careers. So I, I'd love to get into you and your career and your family, because I know there's going to be so many good stories uh, to, to share with, with Do your upbringing and everything else. Pardon me? Do I have to tell the truth? <laughs> Only if we want to. Sometimes, sometimes a little fable might be uh, might be okay too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I said before we got on, like, so the, the Sutter name. I mean, it's still very entrenched in you know in in hockey with with your brother uh, coaching the coaching the Flames and another brother involved in junior hockey with the Rebels and 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 the history with the NHL that that you all had. Uh, but I think this younger generation isn't quite as familiar with the actual like legacy of this, of the Sutter name with, you know, seven brothers and six playing in the NHL and from this small community uh, called Viking in Alberta. And and I just wouldn't mind walking back down memory lane. I know you've probably told the story a hundred times, but you know, what was, what was that like for you guys on the farm growing up and, and, and having all the brothers and, you know, playing hockey and just give us a day in the life of the Sutter family back when you guys were, were minor hockey uh, players. Well, it was a, a small town of just under 1,200 people, and, and our farm, we were eight miles outside of town. So a uh, typical school day would have been walking uh, 100 or so yards from the house out to the road to catch a school bus, and usually at least one or two fights through those 100 yards. 
And uh, if it was winter time, you'd carry your equipment out and leave it on the bus during school at the front of the school bus with the driver. And, and after school, you'd grab your equipment and, and walk the one block down to the, to the hockey rink. And, and, and that's where we played right, right there in town. There was also a lot of, a lot of memories out on the slough, uh, all of us playing with neighbor boys and, and, um, then we had a dairy barn, so we had a big hayloft. So in the summertime, that's where we played up in the hayloft and a lot of fights up there, a lot of bloody noses and, and, um, scraped knuckles and, but, uh, all in all growing up on the farm, mom and dad really laid, laid the, uh, uh, work ethic. We all, all had our own, own duties and, and that's where we learned, learned how to work. And at the end of the day, yeah, we had a little bit of talent, but, but, uh, uh, nothing that, that would have been worth worthwhile having if, if we didn't have the work ethic. So, um, that, that's where it came from right from mom and dad. So that farm life and, and, you know, being farm tough, like I've, I've said that before, cause I've experienced not, not personally, but like playing with guys, you know, that, that, that had that upbringing. And it's just, it's like a strength that's not gym born. I find like, it's just, mm-hmm. there, there's a different level of that. And, and, and it is working with your hands, I think, and, you know, being around and, and doing, doing, doing jobs hourly daily for years, you know, that, that, that provides that, like, what were some of the jobs like with, you having so many brothers, like, could you, like, what would be some of the things that, that you said you guys were assigned to do that would be part of your uh, obligations or, or something you have to be accountable for during the day? Well, in the summertime, mom had a massive garden. So we all had to take our turns weeding and, and hilling potatoes. And, and, and there we had the livestock. So you're feeding cattle, um, chickens, pigs. We, we, we had it all. It was a mixed farm. And then, and then in the in the fall, obviously with harvest, uh, in those years it was a small square bale. So, so that 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 was a job that we all enjoyed because because you knew it was making you stronger. And it was right before the hockey season started. As a kid, uh, once we all turned pro, it was a little different story. And as you know, the the uh, fitness levels and the training training uh, ability or, or services that all the kids have access to today we didn't have that going up on a farm. So like I remember in junior and now they talk about plyometrics, but in junior when the crops were swathed and we were on a pretty hilly piece of, of uh, 640 acres, I used to run half mile from fence line to fence line, jumping the swaths. And that was part of my training for two or three years. Little did I know it was, you know, like, plyometrics or, or what what some guys are doing today in a little different setting right but obviously it paid some dividends <laughs> that's awesome uh you, you mentioned first of all how, how that's one thing i didn't look up so w- with your brothers uh what's the age gap between oldest to youngest how many years is it uh, mom had a tough few years when <laughs> <laughs> she she had seven boys in nine years holy smokes so Seven and, boys. And the twins were the last and that finished her off. She did. She didn't care to have any more after that. <laughs> and no sisters. Was it just brothers? Just brothers. Seven boys. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned about the, the uh, you know, the 200 yards to the bus stop and there'd be a, there'd be a couple of fights in there. I, I assume you're exaggerating. That wouldn't be a daily thing, but I, but I would also assume that there was one or two. Uh, is that, was that just unavoidable with with having boys? Do you think, or was there a competitive nature in you guys from a, from a young age that just existed, where maybe it wouldn't in others? Well, once you got out of the house and you could really say a few things that you wouldn't say in front of mom, then obviously it created some some hard feelings or or <laughs> pissed somebody off. But um, and then at the at, if we were out to the road early on the corner post of the fence, we had a, an old Rogers syrup can, ten can. We'd set that up on top of the fence post and we'd stand there and throw rocks, whoever could knock it off, right? Yeah. And uh, so occasionally somebody had to go up and put that can back on the post. Well, if, if you weren't getting along with them that day, they might get a couple of rocks chucked at them too. So <laughs> there was always something going on. Either you're arguing and fighting over that or arguing about hockey or ball or girlfriends or whatever it might be. It was. It, it happened, uh, I wouldn't say every day, but but I'd say once a week for sure. <laughs> uh, 
did you have uh did you w w within that within that group did you have your uh your nemesis like somebody that you were battling with more so than others you know what i was the uh middle child three older three younger so i could go either way with that depends on, on the day right so <laughs> so i i wouldn't say no no not not one of them in particular but being the middle child i had a little bit of a i call it an advantage right that's awesome i gotta ask it was is there somebody that takes the title as, as being the toughest the guy you didn't want to mess with uh brian was certainly the toughest for sure um he just just uh I don't know, even in the NHL, right? Pound for pound, he was he was one of the toughest guys that's ever played the game. So um and 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 we all did our share of fighting in hockey, as you know, but um certainly we learned a lot of it on the farm or growing up or, or in a small town in those years. There wasn't f the fear with uh classmates or schoolmates like there is now in school, but I mean, you just went out behind the school bus and 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 settled it, and right. that's that's how it was. That's what we grew up with. Does that uh, at what point were you able to concede that title to Brian? You seem to see it without much too much pain in your in your eyes to to give him that title. You couldn't have done that at fifteen or fourteen, though. I wouldn't imagine. No, I think he had it pretty much the whole time, I, as far back as I can remember. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I did read some place that your uh, your oldest brother Gary, and I can't remember who said it, uh, the one that never played in the NHL, and I believe he was the oldest. Uh, I think yeah. Rich might have said that he was the best <clears throat> hockey player. Is that something that you would like give testament to? He was a really good player. Him and Brian left or played it in Vegreville, Alberta, in the, in the Central Alberta Junior B League. Um, the year before Brian went to Red Deer, so Brian would have been 15, Gary 16, and uh, he was he was a defenseman or or a winger. He played with a little nastiness to him. wasn't quite as big as as Brian, but he, his skills were a little more developed than all of ours. And 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 fortunately, once he played junior B there, he decided he he wasn't ready to leave home. And and uh, Brian got the opportunity the following year and went went away and made the Red Deer wrestlers. Right. So it was a choice essentially, right? That he, he decided to play in the farm and, and, and yeah. so be it. And yeah. uh, so, wow, that's pretty wild though, too. Like, I mean, who knows how it would have been for him and his journey, but like even to add another one potentially to, to the list of, uh, of the Sutters to have seven, like what was the secret sauce? Like there had to be something there. You know I mean, other than, well, I guess there's the internal, there's the internal compete level and the internal competitive spirit that obviously was existed and you guys were pushing each other collectively, but holy smokes, like that doesn't mean you should all just make the NHL or the best league in the world. Like, is there something else go going on there? I, I, I can't really say Jason, what it would have been. I mean, I know growing up, right. When you got that many, uh, your parents didn't have the money to afford new equipment, new skates and so on. Um, once we, once Brian opened that door and made it with, with his passion and, and, and great work, work ethic. And then he, he started to score some goals and all that. Like, like we, we, we made homemade shooting boards and stuff like that and spent more time shooting pucks than any, anything else of, of the hockey skills. But once we got into the junior teams and they bought you skates, our skating improved right away because we were going from skates two or three sizes too big for you and with no support to us to escape that fit you. So, and then once you made that step, then, then, you know, you continued to work at it and, and you never took a night or a practice off. And that's obviously, you know, that that's the, those are the habits and, and, and I mean, boy, habits can serve us very well, or they can be our detriment too. So, I mean, you develop those good habits and, and that translates into other things. And you mentioned that Brian had, had that work ethic, which I mean, it sounds like you guys all had, but I mean, having somebody in that leadership position that you can look up to that see that they're, you know, that they're making the best of their opportunity or able to do it must have allowed the belief in everyone else uh, and the example to, you know, to, to make an impact. Yeah. Confidence is such a strange thing too, right? Like once you, you get into the circle and, and, and if your confidence is growing day by day, obviously it's going to push you to higher limits. So, um, and just just watching him when he moved away and and then 
you know, as you know, growing up, everybody wants to win the Stanley Cup. And as little boys, you're always playing to win the Stanley Cup. But once Brian made the junior jump and, and Red Deer and then on to Lethbridge and then was drafted, it, you know what, it, it gave us all a, a big boost. So, um, and eventually, yes, it opened the first door, but after that you had to, you had to earn your own way. Right. So yeah. uh, I think that's what a lot of people overlook. You know, there's times when you hear, well, the younger ones made it because Brian made it and, and so on all the way down the line. But at the end of the day, yeah, you got the first look, but after that you had to do it yourself. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Did you guys, so with seven and nine years, uh, there was lots of crossover as far as like, especially the junior years, like a lot of guys played junior for, you know, three to four years before they turned pro. Uh, did you get a chance to play with any of your brothers at the junior level? My first year when I went into Red Year as a 16 year old, uh, Daryl had been there for one year and then he graduated to Lethbridge after that year. And Brent came in as a 15 year old. So I played with Daryl and Brent and Red Deer and then didn't play with another one until Brent joined the Islanders. Right. And that was, the, was that the only brother you had on your team in the NHL? Yes. 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 My, uh, when I got traded to Chicago, Daryl was, was just starting his coaching career and he was an assistant coach with the Blackhawks at the time. Oh, that would have been interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He was learning, learning and the, uh, ropes and as it turned out you know he went obviously everybody knows he's gone on to quite a quite a uh career coaching so it was a big learning curve for him but we were we were close he was probably my closest brother at the time i would say so and then our wives are real close so it was it was really neat to cross paths with them again and our kids were just tiny then so it was it was special for them too that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and what a great career he has with the Cups and, and everything else, all the success that he's had. Um, yeah, super cool. I mean, I was just looking through 17th, 20th, uh, 179th, 17th, 10th, and 4th. Those are the, the, the selections of, of, of all you uh, guys. And so with the exception of Daryl, who went 179, everyone in this day and age would have considered a first-round selection, uh, which is also super, super cool. Almost 5,000 games co combined. It's really a cool story and one that makes me smile and disbelief. I got three boys now. I don't, I can't remember if I told you that when we were chatting over the weekend and um, yeah, we don't live on a farm. You know, we live at Predator Ridge resort. There, there's, there's nothing similar in the upbringing uh, between yourselves and, and the Padolan boys. However, I do try uh, and parent with a little bit of a, let's say a long rope, you know, like, so allow, uh, it's not like I have to break up every first fight as soon as it starts. Right. Like I've been a little bit allowing them to try and figure it out and, and figure out right. not only their personal space, but how to navigate that competitiveness. And, you know, I mean, all that stuff, I, I think it's important, especially for, you know, especially for boys and, and even like aspiring hockey boys. I think, I think that it's kind of an advantage for them if you let them figure it out on their own. Is that something that you would have imparted in your own family? Like the ability to, yeah, go figure it out. I don't need to be involved in, in everything that's going on. Uh, I think that we raised our three children that way. Um, two girls and, and a boy. Uh, obviously they're very competitive kids and, and have worked very hard to, to get where they're at today. But growing up, um, you know what, Jason, we, I was gone a lot as a player and, and as, as a coach, uh, you know, probably didn't spend the time. I know I didn't spend the time that I probably should have been with the kids, but you're trying to push your career along and, and at the end of the day, you're doing it for, for them. Uh, so I would give credit to my wife, Cindy, more, more so than myself for putting her foot down and doing the, the doing the right things and making them mind. Right. Yeah, no, fair enough. I just find it interesting because like my wife and I have like, cause my, my wife had had a sister, didn't have any brothers and, and she was a professional dancer and, and an actress. So uh, very athletic and competitive in her own right, but not in like a physical component style, right. Of way. So like for her to be exposed to not only me, but the, you know, the three boys and, and what three boys and they're 40 months apart, like front to back. Right. Wow. So they're, so we were busy too there in the younger years and, and they're so close enough that, you know, that there is that sibling rivalry there. It's not like there's somebody that's 18 and the other one's 10, right? They, right. Like they, they have the same interests and they're trying to prove each other and one up each other. And so she, 
she had a real hard time at times with you know like the the things that would be going on in the basement she would just have to remove herself she's like i do not get boys i do not get it <laughs> and thankfully my wife is a very athletic girl and ha has been since we we've known each other when we were children so uh that that certainly helped she was able to to do play every sport with them help, help them along through through uh difficult times or just just to develop skills it was um pretty special to have her like that and then the kids really admired her for that yeah yeah you mentioned playing i mean i i've i've sort of reflected on my own career because i didn't meet my wife until 30 31 and i was retired like i wasn't playing hockey at the time right so we've had uh the our boys and and, and bringing up the boys it's i've kind of chosen careers that i can be around you know and, I, and i'm with them and and i'm keeping them a part of my, of my day and my business and you know by choice but then i I look back kind of on my playing career and the guys that had families, they have the re reflection of like you, you know, they're, they're gone a lot. Right. And there was a lot they had to dedicate and they couldn't be there for them. But the family and that, that ability to have family and something to come home to actually really helped them in their career as well. Right. Because there was like more meaning to it. Whereas a guy sing I was single my whole career and it was only me. And there was kind of, there was nothing to ground yourself to that to that home base so i think that there's advantages and disadvantages of, of both you know like starting a family young or not i think from, on, in one respect it, it, it has never changed and pro probably even into today but a lesson i learned from both al arbor and mike keenan as head coaches was um your your family time during the season is quality not quantity and in the summer, then you got to balance that out more in the off season, right? So it was a really important, uh, I wouldn't say lesson, but important advice from both of those people as coaches. Yeah, because there is a, you do need to find a balance there, right? And understand, yeah. and you, I mean, and the family needs to understand too, right? You know, I mean, of course, like what, what it takes to be a professional athlete is, is uh is a lot you know and uh and and there's going to be some sacrifice but if you can balance that like you say with the with the quantity aspect and make sure you make those moments count i think it i think it can work for sure yeah it was always um, called over quantity during the season. Yeah. just going to take a short break here from the podcast and break to the testimonials who who that have been coming in and as I usually do, or try to do, uh, give give my listeners a reminder to press that review button on the Apple Podcast option, uh, because again, I looked at the stats again the other day. It's like seventy to eighty percent of my listeners are listening on an Apple device, listening on an iPhone. So that means you're listening uh, on an Apple, uh, like probably an iTunes link, and, and you are able to review on iTunes. So if you are one of those people that haven't, um, again, uh, a gentle shove to say, hey, press on the button, put five stars, and tell us what you think about the podcast. That would be fantastic. And I want to celebrate that by reading a couple that have been coming in and just recognize people who are contributing and uh, and recognize what's being said about the podcast. And uh, one came in from WW2374 via Apple Podcasts in Canada. And the title is A Must Listen for Aspiring Players and Parents Five Stars. This podcast has everything aspiring players and parents are looking for. A host that is engaging and shares their view about hockey from experience. Entertaining and relevant guests explores the mental side of hockey and educational for parents and players navigating the hockey experience. So thanks so much to WW2374. Love hearing that. Uh, one more I'll read out quickly here is Love Listening Five Stars from Buffy Puck via Apple Podcasts in the United States. Thank you so much, by the way, for all you people listening in the States. I spent a ton of my career down in the States, and my wife is from the States, and all my boys are dual citizens. So although I am up in Western Canada, and some of our, uh, some of our guests are obviously Western Canadians just because of where I grew up playing hockey, I really appreciate the podcast being spread uh, amongst my American friends. So thanks so much for this. Uh, review Buffy Puck and Buffy Puck says I enjoy this podcast and the insight to all levels of hockey it seems all hockey players uh, all hockey journeys are hard but the grueling process creates some pretty amazing people Jason does a great job highlighting his guests and their character as much as their hockey careers 
So fantastic stuff. I really appreciate those coming in. As I've said before, uh, you'd be surprised at what a difference uh, the reviews will make and the ability for you to talk and to share about them as well because it helps the algorithm but it shows it to new people in new areas uh apple says oh this is uh this is a podcast that people are enjoying that people like to listen to and we're going to show it to more people that might not have heard of the platform before so it's a great way to give back to the podcast if you're a, if you're a listener so thank you so much and if you're new here then yeah press on if you enjoy this if you enjoy this uh podcast by all means please do press on the link and if you are an old timer and you have not done it then darn toot and get in there and do it. You owe me one. All right, back to the conversation with Dwayne Sutter. So let's talk about you. So making the jump. So you get drafted. Um, what was it? You get drafted 17th overall to New York. Uh, they were obviously an up and coming team that was playing. I was playing well. You know, on the verge of something great. And you stepped right into that organization and never played an AHL game in your entire career, like spanning, I think, pretty much ten years. But by the by, the sounds of it, how how was that jump for you? And was it one that you expected to make? Like, was that was that what you thought was in the cards as far as making the Islanders out of camp? Or, or walk me through that whole uh, whole process. Uh, my first year in Lethbridge. Uh, there was no talk during the season of, of underage players being drafted. It was still strictly a 19 year old draft. And, and uh, I had a, a year that was impressive number wise, but totally unexpected by myself. And so I was quite surprised. And then it was the year of the merger of the world hockey and the NHL that that summer and then the draft was done in August that year August the 9th uh, so at the end of the season in the spring to that date they the leagues merged and they decided that underage players would be eligible so that uh, I didn't have a, a all season to fret about it or or even part of the summer it was just like snap your fingers and, and they're they're drafting your age group too um, I, I got draft Mr. Torrey called me and, and said they were going to take me I, I that morning and I said you know I really don't want to go to New York and, and so on and so on and uh, I thought truthfully I thought one of the brothers were pulling my leg and they called and were 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 pretending to be Mr. Torrey so anyways <laughs> uh, about half an hour later the phone rang again and 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 it, and it was Bill Torrey and I had to apologize for for saying what I had to him before and and then training camp came about and they played me in every game. I can't, I think I played all rookie and all NHL games. It was 12, 15 games, something like that. I thought I ha had a quite an impressive camp. I, I won the uh, uh, rookie training camp uh, award, which was kind of cool. But at the end of the day, they decided that I was not quite big enough and, and was maybe go back to junior and, the head scout Earl Ingerfield was living right in Lethbridge, so he could keep his eye on me and and keep in touch with the team. So they had a poor start. They they had a bunch of injuries and, and and the team had a poor start. So they swung out through here in late November and called me up to play in Edmonton and Winnipeg, I think it was. And then I I went back to New York and and never really came back uh they, again they had injuries so it was it was about, about timing as you know you know you can be a high pick but it's all about timing and and, and the surroundings and and getting the break that that you needed so um it, it it was a whirlwind of of from august to november and and then i found myself there and then on we went into the spring and and won the stanley cup so it was it was a really special season yeah, that's uh, that's incredible. I love so, so just to rewind. So, Bill, so you get a call at the farm, and somebody says he's Bill Tory. You get on the phone, you're thinking it's BS, and and you're telling them there's no way you want to go to New York City. <laughs> and <coughs> excuse me, they. Anyways, then then he must have got back to Earl Ingerfield in Lethbridge, and Earl called brother Brian, and told him what happened. And Brian called me and gave me shit. <laughs> and and then uh, it was only a few minutes later that that Bill Torrey called back and said that they took me and with the seventeenth pick. So um, it all unfolded quite quickly. I, I was I was somewhat embarrassed for 
for <laughs> thinking it was it was a prank. But when you grow up with brothers like that, there's use of the odd prank. So it, it is what it is. So, okay, so just from the timeline, so you actually told him, I don't want to go to New York. In the meantime, he ends up drafting you and then calls you back. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. you had to apologize. So he was yeah. not deterred. He, he wanted you anyways. That's great. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was a pretty special year. I mean, Patty Janelle was an old school coach and probably what I needed. My, my rear end kicked a little bit, but, but he also made sure that, that, you know, the pressure that he put on you, uh, and the experience that he had, you you know what you you had to play hard every night or he didn't play, and and that's what Dad would have told us as, as well. So it just turned out to be a, a pretty remarkable season, and then and then before you knew it, uh, you were drafted and then playing that with the Islanders and then and then beating the Flyers in the Cup final. Yeah. So, okay. So you're playing junior. So you have that great year, like you said, an, unex- an unexpected year to use your, your, your words, uh, the 50 goals, uh, season there uh, playing in red deer and have the high draft pick, which is, you know, coming at you in, in April, you're probably out camp in, in September. So like had a month to kind of get ready for it. And, uh, you start back in junior and then you get the call up and you're playing either in Calgary or Edmonton for your first NHL game, uh, with the Islanders. Uh, what was, do you remember that first game and, 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 uh, and what that was like? I remember getting on a little plane in Lethbridge and flying up to Edmonton the night before, walking into the hotel room, and my first roommate was Lauren Henning. And then just the excitement and, and the day went by quicker than I thought it would. The next next day went in Edmonton when we were getting ready to play. Uh, Mom and Dad had come up to watch, and, and so that was special. and. The reason I was called up was they were short of right winger. Mike Boss was hurt, and I played with Brian Trotche that night and and had two goals and an assist. So uh, it, it was it was a pretty impressive outing. I think I think we lost five three, and I was minus two, and I had three goals and an assist. So <laughs> I was on for pretty much every goal. So uh, it, it started off good, and then the next game, I believe, we went into Winnipeg and lined up at a face off across from Bobby Hull. And he smiled at me and he was my idol growing up, right? But in Lethbridge, I also played with Bobby Jr. So we crossed paths a few times with, with Bobby Sr. And so it was it was pretty neat to line up across the across the face-off circle from him. So no kidding. You know, th- those are some memories of the first first couple of games for sure. Well, that's wild. I'm so glad I asked. Two goals and one assist in your first game ever in the NHL. Yeah, right place, right time, and playing with a pretty special player in Brian Trotche. So, Trotche he also thought- played junior. He was a center, Brian, brother Brian's center iceman in Lethbridge in Brian's rookie season. Oh, okay. So, so Trotche got, got, a, got his share of, of Brian and Brent and I over the years. Right, right. That's great. Um, so when you're walking in Edmonton there, is that, is that pre Gretzky at that year? Like, was he around yet or he, he was there? Yeah. Yeah. He was there. Yeah. So your first game ever against, against Gretzky playing with Trache, uh, that's pretty wild. And then you get to play against your, your boyhood idol in, in Hull. I remember, I remember my, which you probably didn't know at the time, but my guy was Mario Lemieux growing up and, uh, and one of the last games I played with Florida before I got traded there that year, my rookie year at the deadline was in Pittsburgh against Mario and the Penguins. And that was on my birthday, actually, February 18th. So that's a, that's still like a special game for me because yeah. that's such a weird, I don't know what the right word is, but you know, like to, that you're there, right? Like playing with this guy that you've just idolized, like from afar, it seems like, and, and you're now a peer. It's like a really weird moment, I think. It's like living it in person, but you've you've dreamt it many times, right? Right. right? Yeah. You've, been, you've you've been there before. Yeah. In a dream. So, so then, so yeah, so like, so you're with the Isles, and then you guys go on, and like, what was the feeling there? I mean, you, one, you're trying to figure out the league. I mean, you're a young, you're a young pro, right? Like, you're you're obviously trying to figure it out. You want to be an NHLer. Um, yet this, the team has these aspirations outside of you just trying to fit in and, and, and earn your own spot. Like what, what was that, what was that year like there hidden up to the, hidden up to the first cup? Well, they had great leadership obviously. And, and most of it was, most of it was from Western Canadian guys. So 
you know, they, they were very helpful along with the Eastern guys like Denny Potvin so, and Mike Bossy. It was, as the season went on and, and I became more familiar with my teammates, it was very, a very major topic was teams thought they could push us around. And Mr. Torrey made a couple of trades and uh, one of them was bringing Gordy Lane in and, and myself and we could both handle ourselves well enough. And then, you know, you had the Nystroms, the Howitz, the Gillies, the Lormers. You, you had enough other toughness. So round two, we played Boston. And everybody said, if we could prove ourselves coming through there, then, then we had a good shot to get, get to the finals. And we could play pretty much any style that was thrown at us. Um, Boston, I think we beat them in five games. And it was the famous Gillies and O'Reilly fights four or five times and and we had two or three brawls i believe so anyways at the end of the day we stood up to them we won the battle we won the war and then we faced another team in buffalo a totally opposite type team a highly skilled team with the french connection and they had some pretty solid goaltending then as well with and then be on the blue line jim Seanfield, guys like that so we we won that series I can't remember, maybe six games. And then we had another physical challenge come ahead of us when we played the Flyers. And uh, we had some co internal confidence against the Flyers. And later in the season, we stopped, a, I can't remember the number of games, but they've won 20 some consecutive home games. And we went into the spectrum and, and beat them there. So that gave us some confidence and, and going into the finals, we, we knew we could play with them. It was just a matter of how the chips fell. And, and fortunately they, they came our way. Yeah. That's uh do you remember how many games that series went? That went six games. I, uh, we were talking about it at the re reunion last weekend and, and uh, Dennis Potvin brought up, he, he scored the first power play overtime game in the history of the NHL. Game one in Philly, we got a power play in overtime, and, and Dennis scored the winning goal. So we kind of we got 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 the jump start, winning winning in their building again, where we were confident. But then it turned out we ended, had to go home and win in six. And and the talk around the dressing room was we got to lay it all on the line tonight, boys, because going back to Philly and having to win a second time in, in that series in their building in Game Seven might have been a little bit more than we could handle. So. All right. It was, uh, we were all quite ecstatic to win it in game six at home. There wasn't, uh, to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, there wasn't, like, that was the first time at, at winning at all, right? There wasn't really playoff success prior uh, prior to that year and, and, and winning the whole thing. Is that accurate? With the Islanders? or Yeah, with the Islanders. Um, well, the previous year, they'd won the league regular season, and then the Rangers upset them in playoffs. So... You know, again, they had motivation and 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 they knew what kind of reputation they had outside. So, right. the trades that Mr. Tory made and uh, certainly pushed them over the over the hump. Yeah. So Al, Al Arbor on that puck that we that we had. Um, so we, we we got this 50th anniversary puck that is gold plated or something. The thing weighs like 50 pounds and and um, and it, it's a mem memorabilia piece. But on the back they. They have a quote on there from Al Arbor. It says, this is, there is no team with greater character in any sport than this team. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure when he said that. I assume he probably said it after after you guys had won four in a row. Uh, but you were there for all four. Like, obviously biased. I understand that. And, you know, I mean, you were a part of it. But, like, can you speak to the character of, of that team and what and what the makeup was like there? You know what? We, we were a really tight group. Um, obviously, when you go out on the road, Everybody doesn't go the same direction, but when you walked in that dressing room, then you were you were brothers, and and even, even to take that a little bit in a little bit different spin on it, Jason is whenever we'd play teams that you had a brother on, you talked to them the night before, but you didn't talk to them again until after the game, and it was because you were in the dressing room with your brothers, so to speak, yeah. and that that's that's the demeanor we had internally with the Islander team. And Mr. Tory would always make one or two trades just to tweak it to keep everybody honest. And and there were times when popular players, teammates went out of the dressing room to add add something to get us over the 
over the hump for, for another Stanley Cup run. And um, at the end of the day, it was just the belief we had in each other and, and, and the trust we had in each other. And, and you knew the guy beside you in the dressing room had your back all the time. Yeah, that's uh, it's a special feeling, right? And I mean, you had that early, uh, obviously, in your career. And like that was the only thing that you had experienced uh, at that point. Then you went on and played other places. And, I, you know, I, I've spoken to that on a personal level, like being around Florida my rookie year and, and what, what that team felt like after the success they had the, the, the previous season, you know, and what that locker room felt like. And then to go to the uh, Los Angeles or to go to Toronto or go – uh, to Tampa, uh, Islanders, all when they weren't doing well. Like, it was completely kind of a different feel in the room. Like, it's something that uh, you can feel at the time. I couldn't really put my finger on what it was. But did, did you – like, how do you recreate that, I guess? Like, how do you – like, when people are talking about culture and now as a coach or as a GM, like, how do you get that to happen in a locker room? I think that the top teams, even in today's league, you see how quite quite often they'll trade for somebody – that's already won a Stanley Cup somewhere to bring some of that feeling into the locker room. And, and most likely they're going to have success at the, the most popular one in the, in the last many, many years was when Colorado took Ray Bork in, right. And Ray Bork, Boston, they'd never been, I think he'd been to the final, but never won. So he, he had the feeling he also played in a lot of Canada cups and, and, and high end international hockey to play with other players from the NHL who had won before. So that, that is a good example of bringing some, but a star player in, but quite often it's not a star player coming in. It's, it's a role player that, that fills the hole and, and, and a need that the team needs. And, and I think it, at the, in those times, that player coming into a new environment is appreciated even more than a star player yeah. because you need you need a full roster and you got to be deep right through and guys have to accept their roles otherwise you're not going to win and i mean you, you you see that pretty much every year yeah well the trade deadline is such an important piece i think for gms in, in in this day and age maybe even more so than in years past because the game itself uh it's almost like it's two different seasons right like it's a season well it's always been two different seasons but there's a like there's a team that you need to get to the playoffs, but that's not the same team that you need to win the playoffs oftentimes. Right. right? right. Um, so, yeah. So like, to your point, that's why you bring in these more, like these more sandpaper guys, these more role player guys, like the guys that are, that are going to be that glue and, and maybe the bottom six of your team, because you're going to have to play four lines in the playoffs and play with some, play with some grit and some nastiness, you know, to probably, to probably win those 16 games that are required to win. Um, so I, I do, I, I think there is a little more architecture involved, right? Cause sometimes you can have this great team that crushes the regular season, but it's not really a playoff team and, and managers have a hard time this day and age to figure that out. This di- playoffs are a different game. It doesn't matter. The rules have changed a lot since you and I played, but it, it is a different game. There's more intensity. Uh, <clears throat> I think everybody, even the officials are more, more apt to give a little bit and and let let teams play let let the players settle it on their own so to speak um but you're right you need you might need 10 defensemen at the end of the playoffs you might need both goalies to step up and you don't know how many forwards you're going to use 15 16 forwards for sure usually at some point and it might not be for a lot of minutes it might only be five to eight minutes a game but those are critical minutes as you know so it you yeah. you need the whole whole roster and in today's game, it's a little bit more difficult for the GMs to pull in a, a star player or whatever because of the cap concerns everybody has. And, and there's a lot of teams that are, that are really teetering to the cap level right now, right? They're, they're all, all right there. So you got to move money out to get money in or, or have some major injuries that you can slide somebody onto LTI to, to get you through. And um, there, there, you, you need, you need some, some people that understand the math and can, can control that day-to-day cap situation. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you mentioned about 
you know, being brothers and game day was for game day with your teammates and, and, you know, that you wouldn't talk to the other team. Uh, Tortorella is pretty famous. I think a couple of years ago for, for one of his quotes about, you know, the game's too effing nice, you know, like guys talking off of face-offs and, you know, guys are joking it up and warm up. And, you know, that was definitely, I mean, even more so in your era than maybe mine, uh, but maybe a little bit of both. There's crossover there that, you know, yeah. game day was game day and, and, uh, you know, friends weren't friends on game day. Does that, does it, is there a part of that that irks you at all in today's game that it has gotten to be like that? Or, or do you think it's just a sign of the times and, you know, go with the flow? It certainly does irk me. And I'm sure it does a lot of old school coaches like Tortorella or Brother Daryl. But, but like you said, it's a sign of the times, right? Everybody knows everybody. And, and through social media or whatever it might be, everybody knows everybody. And there's, enough players that play in several different organizations. So you, you make friends, you move on, you make new friends and move on. So uh, I think it's certainly hard to avoid it as a player today, but I would, if I was coaching today, I would hope that come playoff time, it's, there's more direction and, and, and focus on your own team and, and just staying away from, from mixing with the opponent. Right. I remember uh, it just came to me. I was after after the trade uh, from you guys. I, I was in Toronto and we played in Toronto. Like it always works out that way, right? Like so, I ended up playing against against uh, the Panthers and and I was on the ice for a goal against. I think is how that happened. And then it was a, uh, they left me on the ice and and Pi, but Dave Lowry came up for the draw and so we were lined up in a way that like I was facing our benches right and so you know Pi like I don't remember exactly yeah. what he said but he he said something to me um that was a joke or like was you know blah 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 and so I, I don't know what I said but I guess I smiled to him or when I said something like I re responded to him I, I did something anyways I played my shift I got back to the bench and Mike Murphy who was the head coach in Toronto just like completely ripped me like rip me a new one over like any type of you know communication which yeah. it wasn't anyways it was just like that's just the time then right like you think you're fr you're friends with him you think he's your friend and you know anyways it was nothing to do with any type of conversation about being a friend but that was sort of the way that was looked at and now it's like my gosh they're yucking it up and warm up and you know anyways i yeah. i learned quite pretty quickly to keep your head down and uh and not say anything to anybody there with my experience with my in a lot of ways it's it's a different game today but in a lot of ways it still is the same game yeah 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 i know good point um what aspects do you think are like just with the game itself? I guess what where do you think it's it's made it's made strides, and and where do you think uh, and where do you think there is that element or whatever element you're referring to as being the same? Well, taking the red line out certainly made a change in, in the in the speed of the game, and and in my opinion, made it made it probably more dangerous for for the defenseman going back for pucks. There's a lot of speed created between the blue lines, and the forecheck can be a lot. A lot quicker on you now mind you the icing is is different that rule is different which is helpful for to uh prevent injuries um the equipment the skates the sticks obviously all that has has made the game faster uh the fitness games as players are way more fit than we were and so from no in that way it's changed the game but I've had guys come up to me and, and say, well, you guys could never play in today's game. And my, my answer back to that is when they changed all these rules, the whole league didn't bring in all brand new players. The, the current players adjusted, right? They, yeah. they, they made the change and, and, and they adjusted. And so I don't buy what, what today's players say with, you know, we couldn't play today. And on the flip side of that, when it was a nastier game, when we played, I think a lot of today's players couldn't play years ago. Right. Yeah, I think more so that way than than us learning to play today's game. Yeah, I mean, if you're the best athlete or the best players at the time, you're still going to be the best players at the time, right? You just adjust to the rules. I, I don't yeah. think that I don't think that changes, but I do think that there's a way. I've covered that just with what I do now, Dwayne, with like my my high performance uh, mindset coaching. Like I, the the idea 
like the funnel is really narrow is the way I kind of say it. Like as far as like the personality types that would, that would make it to the NHL, right. There was like a kind of a certain way to do things. Like there was a real attrition process, right. To get there that you were weeded out if you couldn't handle a, B, C, or D, right. Like you, you had to really want what you did and you had to show up and answer the bell when times uh, called for it. That, that, that funnel I think is a lot wider now because like that type of uh that type of fortitude or that type of resiliency or that sort of test, you know, isn't really in the, in the game. So it, it is allowing kind of a, what definitely it's a more skilled game, but I do think there's a lot more personalities involved in it, which is, which is why I think it's, it's, it's a competitive advantage now as a general manager is to really identify those guys that are willing to do those things, you know, that, that, that have that makeup, because I think that there's less guys willing to do things uh, that maybe win championships now. I think the high end skill is, is better. Like for example, maybe your top two defensemen, top six forwards. I think there's more skill in, in that group than there was years ago. Like there might've been today, you might have, six really high-end skilled forwards well in those years maybe there was only three but so from i agree from that in that respect it, it's changed some um but you still need a little bit of everything to win yeah. the Stanley cup yeah for sure you do and i just look at back in the teams that have that, that are that are winning right for sure like there's obviously a lot of t- a lot of talent a lot of skill on st louis mm-hmm. and and uh tampa and, and colorado named the last few but there's still those guys that that know how to get it done in the you know in the six through nine slot or 12 slot and plus the defenseman so um yeah i mean it's a it, it's fun to, I, I like having the conversations too but i mean even looking back on your team now with the islanders you I mean you had i mean by many account with dennis pop and one of the top 10 to 15 players to ever play the game i mean mike bossy has to rank up there as it, the, one of the best, if not the best, you know, I mean, but depends on who you talk to because his career was cut short as far as from a goaltending standpoint. Brian Trotche, one of the all-time best. Like, those guys are obviously going to be just fine playing hockey <laughs> to today, right? But maybe speak to those guys. I guess those would be the big three on that team. Uh, maybe um, maybe there's some there's some other honorable mentions, but, like, out of those out of those three players, the, the one that most interested to me just because he was a right shot and he was a scorer and I didn't see him play very much was – was Mike Bossy like what was what made him so special and and I guess in your mind like how special was he? Well, him and Trotch found a very unique chemistry from from one of the first year of Boss's career, and I, even in today's game, I I don't see see what they did. They would come out. Bossy would get a breakout pass from Potvin, and Boss and Trotch could exchange the puck three maybe four times before they got to the far blue line. So the back checkers were having trouble. The defense keying in on who, who to take would, would have a tough time reading it. But they just had a unique chemistry. And, and Bosch in the offensive zone could find find the holes to get open. And, and Trotch found them. And he had, Boss had a sneaky release. He almost cut the puck. And I've said many times, a lot of guys shot the puck traveled this way. When Boss shot it, it, he cut it and it traveled on on end, right? Like, and wow. like you 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 would see replays and and well, where did that puck go? Like there there's no hole there, whether it be five hole or somewhere in the top of the net. But the way he cut the puck, it tra- it had a different way of traveling through the air, and and it found the hole and squeaked its way in sometimes, most of the time. That's amazing. Sometimes he beat them clean, so it didn't matter. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, he, I don't have the stats in front of me, but just I, I think he had, like, he never didn't score 50 goals, right? Like, every, every year, I think, that he played, I think he had, he had like, so many consecutive 50-goal seasons, and obviously, you got to be doing something right. Would, would you say, like, as far as the next generation of player, would he have been somewhat similar to, like, a Brett Hall type? Like, was he just, like, a pure shooter that was really good at finding that open sp- space? Uh, I would, yeah, that's a good comparable. Uh, Yuri Curry came in about the same time and, and, and had had a lot of success as well it's the chemistry they find they find with with certain players and 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 even the one one of boss's last seasons that, that he had remarkable stats he played that whole year with brother brent and john tonelli so uh it, again he found a way and it, it, it it's an attestment to how good of a player he really was when he came into the league the rangers passed on him three times in that first round that year before the Islanders got him. 
and the knock on him was skating and he couldn't play defensive hockey well he found a way to to improve his skating and and maybe a big part of that was how him and Tross move the puck between each other mm-hmm. and the other part was he learned how to play defense because because of Al Arbor's coaching and at the end of the day it wasn't nice to remember myself on the ice all the time it, when you're protecting a lead it, it was um, basically boss got the chance and 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 it it put the fear of God into some defenseman because they wanted to get rid of the puck and, and, he, and then he also scored probably seven to ten 10 goals in the empty net right. a year. So he, he, he earned exactly everything that he got. That's awesome. And Dennis Potvin, uh, you know, said to be one of the best defenders of, of, of the history of, of the game. And, and, and by, by some, you know, the undeniable leader of, of that group, he wore the C there through those cups. You know, maybe speak uh, about Potvin a little bit. Denny was, was a very powerful skater um, hard to knock off the puck um, had good separation speed going back to retrieve pucks carrying the puck up the ice found a way to get it to the net whether it be the big slap or just a, an old, old school wrist shot um, defending he is such a powerful guy on his skates and he loved the hip check and he took more guys out of the blue line. And if, if, if he didn't get them, just miss them. But the word was out around the league and, and especially in our, our division, you better have your head up when you're coming through the neutral zone or, or, or entering the offensive zone because Dennis, Dennis will get you. And um, he, you know what, he was an awesome captain. He, he was, I would say he was more of a quiet leader than he was a vocal guy, but uh, you know, there's always in those years, it was Bobby or Dennis Potvin, Bobby or Dennis Potvin. Well, they were both, as we know, very special players. And, right. and you could argue today that Denny was the best and argue tomorrow Bobby Orr was the best. So regardless, it's still pretty special to, for them to be mentioned in the same sentence. Yeah, for sure. Who was he? Was he the one who kept the guys accountable? You know, I mean, the, the accountability is a big word in, the, in, 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 you mean, now for sure, like coaches and, and accountability to the players and, and, uh, you know, what the expectations are and the standards. Uh, and to me, it always sounds, seems like, I mean, I'm sure Al Arbor was responsible for that. The head coach definitely has a big role to play, but I think once the, once the head coach leaves the dressing room and they're not in there all the time, you know, the boys have to take care of themselves and, and a room that monitors themselves uh, is is usually more successful. It, was he the one that that held 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 the boys accountable? I think in that dressing room of the nine or the sixteen guys that won four cups each, uh, I I think that we had probably half a dozen guys who could have wore the C in there. Some guys never did. Um, I mean, you had Gillies, Tanelli, Trache, Potvin, Nystrom, like. You, you can keep going like that. Like we, we had several guys. Um, and I think, I think the guy that probably, I wouldn't say had the most respect, but when he stood up, everybody just kept quiet and listened. And, and I would say that was Clark Gillis. That's yeah. cool. What made Clark special? Just, you know what? He was a big man, big, intimidating guy. And, and, uh, not very often did, did he stand up and speak, but, but like I say, when he did, it was meaningful and everybody took it to heart and paid attention. It wasn't, it wasn't a bunch of BS. It was, it was straight at you. And, and it, it was, you know what, uh, to this day, he, he was, he was probably my most favorite teammate. Oh, that's amazing. Great Testament. And, uh, we lost him. When, when when did we when did when did that when, when did when did we lose Clark? That wasn't that it long was ago, a, right? It was a year a year this past Saturday when we were all together. Year today. I'm going to take a short break from the podcast to remind you about what Up My Hockey is. For many of you, you just know Up My Hockey as the podcast and of the conversations that I have, which is fantastic. But Up My Hockey is really becoming a bit of a movement. And what do I mean by a movement? Well. The movement is being created because of the overall philosophy about what being your best actually means. 
And in this day and age, there has been such an incredible focus on on on-ice skill development and off-ice physical development, whether it be nutrition or training, that what is left as the biggest competitive advantage for your athlete is personal development, mindset development, mental growth. And that's where the uh, my hockey philosophy comes in, that the holistic development of your player, the person behind your player, is going to give them the greatest advantage in today's marketplace. And you know that com- the hockey is a marketplace. There are only so many players for so many jobs. And how are you going to stand out? And how are you going to be able to play your best and thrive when the lights are the brightest and the stakes are the greatest. How are you going to be able to keep your confidence high? How are you going to have the self-esteem to push through? How are you going to have the courage and the curiosity to ask the right questions and to stand up for yourself at the right time? How are you going to be able to be the best teammate and be that locker room guy that all coaches and managers want? How are you going to do that authentically and keeping your best interest in heart, yet make a memorable impression on people? And that is the idea behind holistic development. And that is really what my hockey is. So when I'm working with players, whether it be on the ice or whether it be my spring teams or whether it be in my co- co- group coaching or whether it be in my peak, uh, peak potential hockey project, that is what I am trying to encourage. I am talking to players about something that they absolutely love, which is the sport of hockey, where they have big dreams and big goals. And I'm giving them the tools to align thoughts, words, and actions with those goals and dreams. And when that trifecta happens, thoughts, words, and actions aligning with goals and dreams on a consistent basis, great things happen. And it also spills out to areas outside of hockey because these skills apply everywhere. So it's a really fun thing to be a part of this up my hockey uh, momentum that is actually happening right now. And I just wanted to remind all of you that there is ways to participate. If you are a hockey parent or a hockey coach or a hockey administrator, Up My Hockey can come to you. Uh, what is the focus for the 2023-24 season is to serve academies, schools, associations with a plug-and-play program that you can provide to your players uh, the support that they need to empower your players to understand the choices they have in the moment that can make them more resilient, more self-aware, more confident in all situations so they can play their best more consistently. If that sounds like something you would like to provide your players, like I said, whether it be an individual team, whether you're uh, a parent of an individual player, or whether you are a president or vice president of an association, and you are looking for support for your players that are going to give you the necessary advantage to allow your players to get the support they need, um, then you have found the right place in Up My Hockey. So reach out to me, www.upmyhockey.com. That's where you find all things Up My Hockey, uh, whether it be my on-ice programs or my off-ice programs. And I would love to have a conversation about how we can support the best interest of your players. Now, back to the episode with Dwayne Sutter. One name I haven't brought up, but uh, maybe we should, Billy Smith, you know, back because uh, he was with the Islanders uh, back, back in the day. And I got, when I was with the Islanders, he was there working with my uh, my roommate, Ricky DiPietro at the time. So we heard we heard a lot of stories from Billy and I got to know him pretty well. Um, definitely had that childlike, you know, twinkle in his eye when he would tell some stories and he, he loved he loved reminiscing but you could tell that he was you know he was fiery and he was a competitor you know was was he was he one of the engines on on the, on the back end there like he, he definitely he seemed like he had a pretty hot furnace what, what was he like to play with during those years on a game day he said nothing and you stayed clear of him he, he had a little six foot radius out in front of his locker and you didn't you didn't go into there and and he didn't skate very rarely did he skate on a pregame skate when he was playing that night. Um, certainly, he's 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 pr- he's proven himself as one of the best, if not the best, playoff goalie in history of the league. And um, but he 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 wasn't he wasn't always one of the guys that would step up and say something. Like it was either, like I said before, Nystrom or Trache mm-hmm. or or uh, Gillies or Dennis um Tanelli, like like we had a lot of leaders and you know even even brent became captain after a while and, and butch gorian had a lot to say and myself so 
um, Billy was was in the group, but but he wasn't front and center, so to speak. We just knew you you, you knew every game he was ready to play. You just right. you, you didn't have to worry about about come on, Smitty, let's bring in goal or something like that. It was it was all he he was there, especially come playoff time. Yeah, he was. Uh, he looked like the ultimate competitor back there. As far as you know, seeing competitive juices from a goaltender, I mean, he definitely wore his heart and his heart in his sleeve. Um, looking back on those four championships, and you know, now it's it's hockey lore, really. I mean, like the battles between you know the Edmonton Oilers and yourselves, and like the stories out of the Edmonton Oilers camp at the first time when they lost to you guys, and what they had to learn from you know from playing against your group and stuff. Was uh, any any of them more memorable or or? Uh, you know, are you more proud of, of any of them or what the toughest battle was in, in the four? We, you know what, we are, we're, our backs were against the wall many times, but somebody always found a way to come through, whether it be Tonelli or Nystrom or Kenny Morrill was an under, underrated guy that, that always seemed to score some overtime goal. It, there were so many moments that, that you thought we were done and then somebody would step up and, uh, it seemed to be a different guy, whether it be who was hot, who was on a, on a roll at the right time, um, whatever it might be, certain situations in a game, it wasn't always scoring a goal. It was, may have been a, a scrap or taking somebody from the other team out, out into the penalty box. So uh, there, there's, there's certainly many, like the overtime goal, Bobby Nye's, uh, uh, cut, we come back one of those cup years, I'm not sure which one it was, from uh, Pittsburgh had us down right into game seven and they hit the goal, Bullard hit the goal post. We went down and scored the, the winning goal to advance. Uh, the Rangers had us our backs to the wall several times. Capitals did. Uh, there, There's just so many different times that, that, that we thought we were done, but somebody found a way to, to come back. We had, we had somebody watching out for us for four plus years and then we knew Edmonton was a new kid on the block. We had beat them twice in in previous playoff series, and and we knew that with their their age and, and their skill level, that eventually they would be our 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 nemesis. And it turned out they were. But right. the one rule, or the one rule, the one one record, I think, Jason, that will never be broken by in any professional sport is we won four straight cups. That was sixteen playoff series plus three more series, 19 consecutive playoff series wins before Edmonton beat us in year five. So I think that's a record that, that certainly tells everybody what kind of team we are. It doesn't matter whether we're voted as the number one team in NHL history that, that, that came out a few years ago or not, but nobody will ever break that record. Yeah, that's super impressive. What was it like? I mean, I, I'd probably do do this podcast a disservice if I didn't ask you a question about Wayne Gretzky and, and, and that team specifically. Um, just because that was the, I mean, that was the heyday. That was the Gretzky heyday, right? I mean, and he's considered by pretty much everyone in the world that uh, to be the greatest of all time. Like, what was the game plan against him? One and, and two. Um, what what made him be who he is? Just a uh, very extraordinary sense for the game he could think it a step ahead of everybody else um i think all of his skills like for example his skating a lot of people underrated it he, he was sneaky quick and slippery very hard to line up for a clean check and then there were other guys there right like he would had Messi playing right behind him and gary curry and and Paul Coffey, and they had good, solid goaltending. And then, then they had warriors like Kevin Lowe and Randy Gregg and guys like that. So they were a team that they eventually they were going to win. One way or the other, they're gonna, they were going to win. And I think the final thing that got them over the hump is, well, one is we, we had run into a bunch of playoff injuries, which every team faces, so it wasn't a, was not an excuse. But the other thing is, from the previous two years we beat them, they didn't have the grinding type guys that you and I spoke about earlier on the podcast. And they added some third and fourth line guys to give their team some grit and a couple of guys on the back end. And, and at the end of the day, that's what made the difference. That's, that's what balanced the playing field and, 
and then the youth uh, took over. Yeah, that's cool. So, but as far as like Wayne specifically, like obviously you knew that he had to be, well, I mean, he was the engine, right, of, of that team. And, and I mean, his, his playoff uh, success just from a point standpoint was obviously, you know, un- unmatched as well. Like, what would you, like, did you guys shadow him at all? I can't, I mean, I never, I don't remember watching those series, but like, what, what was the game I plan? I, answer, I guess I didn't answer that question. That they, number one was stay on the penalty box because their power play was lethal. They had, they had, they had too many horses that, that could score. Uh, second of all, you know, he loved, loved to, the long pass behind your defense. So the defense had to be aware of it. And then one of his favorite plays setting up behind the offensive team net. Well, we ha- you had to try and cut that puck off before it got to him. And, and then just basically playing a tight, tight defensive zone group of five down low on your end so they couldn't penetrate if they were going to score it had to be from the outside and then it was up to smitty right easier said than done right <laughs> that's right yeah. <laughs> it worked worked for a few series but after that sure. last one they had a number <clears throat> so maybe let's go move on uh in, into your coaching career so you was that something that you knew towards the end of your career that that you wanted to be involved in the game still and and, and get behind the bench when I retired in Chicago, Bob Pulford had offered offered me an opportunity to go into the farm team to be the head coach in Indianapolis, or to go home to biking and and do some amateur scouting for the team. And and at the time, our parents were getting older, and and it was a good thing that we did go home. Uh, my wife lost her dad the year next year, so it was. It was a special time for us to go go back there. I learned the scouting field for two years and decided that I wanted to get into coaching. Uh, went into Madison Hat for half a season and then and then went into uh, Indianapolis. That job opened up again that that had been offered to me three years prior to that. So went down there and and just slowly ground it out and eventually ended up in in Florida where you and I crossed paths and. Then I got the opportunity to be head coach when when Terry Murray and his staff were let go. But that was at the time I didn't feel I was ready for it. But when you're offered to be a head coach of one of the National Hockey League team, you're not going to turn it down, right? So I went in there and, and at Christmas time, and and we had some success for the remainder of that season. I signed a contract with with Bill Torrey to be the, the coach for, for two more years after that in, in the springtime in July, ownership changed and a guy named Alan Cohen bought the team and came in while well, he'd grown up in New York city, sitting in MSG. Obviously the, they won the cup in 94. So right away he was, he was talking about Mike Keenan in the, in the media and everything. And Mike was living in South Florida at the time. So I didn't feel comfortable from day one at training camp. I just thought that, uh, you know what, you had to be a really outstanding team to, to carry on. So it was, it was a little bit like the Boudreaux situation that the, that a lot of the hockey world is familiar with now mm-hmm. where you knew somebody was hanging over your shoulder. And uh, so I, I lasted until U.S. Thanksgiving that year, and, and that was it. But again, I, was, I didn't feel I was 100% prepared for it but you're not going to turn an opportunity down like that. So sure. um, at the end of the day, you know what, it was, it's a stressful job. You're dealing with, with a lot of different, different athletes, di- different types of people. So, um, you know, what, it probably wasn't for me. Right. What about, um, what about that experience there? Like when, when we crossed past there, me and my rookie year, that was after the, that was after that cup run, like maybe speak to, to that team and, and that experience there and being with, with, uh, you know, Doug McLean, Lindy Ruff was part of the staff. There it was a pretty, uh, pretty good coaching, coaching group for sure. And, uh, and a kind of a special group of pit players, you know, I mean, a bunch of, you know, kind of journeymen at that point, you know, they were the original sort of mm-hmm. um, cast offs isn't the right word, but, you know, they were taking the expansion draft and they kind of had this, a, a, a new opportunity to, to do something great. And, and the personalities in that locker room were pretty special too. Maybe you can speak to speak to that team a little bit. The character was awesome and personalities also. Um, 
you know, the Scrudlins of the world, the, the Melambies, and, and you can go right all the way down the, the line. And then you had had some other players that weren't as well known, like Robert Svela. Got to use good. Hey? They, they drafted uh, yourself, Radek Dvorak, hey, Jovanovsky, Rob Niedermeyer, quality, quality players with a lot of potential, right? So uh, it was, some of them had to take on a different role than what they would have in a more established team, but they thrived on it, right? And we could play any one of the four lines against the top lines in around the league. Like the year we went to the final, we beat Pittsburgh with Mario and, and, and Yager. We beat the um, Flyers with Lendros's big line. So at the end of the day, we could play anybody against anybody and and have success but we had to play in groups of five and the guys really were focused on on attention to detail so it, it gave us short-term success and then i think the organization lost their direction a little bit once they brought in pavel bury and they couldn't keep in keep together the core of the character guys um it it changed and and changed a little bit too quickly for my liking but um it, it should have gave younger guys opportunity to play, but then they realized that, that, that like in your situation, Jason, they realized that they, they were lacking character again. So that along came your trade for Kirk Muller. So, you know, right. he won a Stanley Cup and, and so on. And he was, he was an older player, but that's really how, how that trade came to fruition. It was, they felt they were lacking some leadership and they had some good young talent like yourself, David Nemirovsky, for example coming up yeah yeah and that was um uh, that was i mean you talked about the new ownership coming in and, and you know i've spoken to it on the podcast a little bit before but you know the the leafs were was who was supposed to like cliff fletcher told me at my draft that he was going to take me with their first round selection that year and then like mm -hmm. uh the next day he didn't and and uh anyways it was it was extenuating circumstances which he told her there's a there's a death in his scouting in his scouting staff and 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 that guy's guy was eric fisho so they end up taking eric fisho kind of in memorandum of of, of this uh of this gentleman but anyway so like so toronto meaning cliff kind of ended up getting their guy right so like would have been a great opportunity for me i was there uh for those yeah. last nine games or ten games and then and then they got fired right and then neil smith comes in and and I didn't really realize it at the time, but holy smokes, did that change the trajectory for me? Like, I just was not a part of the mix, like, for whatever reason. I mean, you'll never really know why, but, yeah. you know, Neil Smith had wanted nothing to do with me, even regardless of, like, the ridiculous success I was having in the AHL and that they weren't in the they weren't in the, uh, in the playoff run. So it's kind of interesting. You mentioned opportunity earlier, right? Like, what could have been a great opportunity turned out yeah. not to be a great opportunity, kind of be the exact opposite. And... Uh, sometimes you just feel like you're spinning your tires. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know what? Like, like I, I've, I've lived it the last few years too with my son Brody. He played 12 NHL games, but when he had, when there was opportunity with injury to go up, maybe for an extended period of time, he was injured in the minors. Happened twice, and I mean for different reasons, right? So it's opportunity and timing and all that. And and for for your podcast viewers. I can I can honestly say that that Jason Padalan was an NHL player that did not get that genuine opportunity. So it, it it's it sucks, and it sucks for a lot of young guys. And and, and unfortunately, it, that's just the way it's been forever. And right. all I can say is I feel I feel bad for yourself. I feel bad for my son. And there's 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 many other young young players like that 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 with opportunity would have made it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I appreciate. It. I mean, I mean, thank you for that, and and for everyone listening, uh, Dwayne took the time to tell my son uh, in the hotel lobby that you know I was a special player and he should be proud of me, and I mean that was that was really gracious of you, and and thanks for doing that in front of, in front of my son. But um, yeah, it's just it's interesting, right? When you look back on on our own journeys, I mean, you obviously have the perspective of yours and and me with myself, but it would have been. It would have been interesting. That was such a shock that trade to me. Like no idea that that was coming, right? And and uh, and I kind of thought I was going to retire a Florida Panther in ten years. You know, like that was that was that's what I thought. And it would have been interesting to stay with that group because it was a it was a cool group. And I thought that uh, even the way even the way I was used, like it wasn't. 
you know, I wasn't on the power play necessarily or playing top line minutes, but I mean, that was just the process, right? I mean, like you guys were, were very open with that. Like you were happy with, with how things were going. It wasn't like anyone was upset with, with me or my output. It was just, you know, do, do the job that you were asked to do. And I thought I, I thought I was doing it and, and that was the trajectory. Right. But uh, it would have been neat to stay a part of that uh, development system there. 99% of the time when you get traded, it's because also the team has seen something in the past that they loved. Just And, and you, you said that a few minutes ago, that, that the Maple Leafs were a team that certainly showed interest to you that previous summer. Mm-hmm. What are those discussions like? I mean, I never actually even thought of this before. Like, did did, did you know, like, would, would, uh, uh, like the GM, would he come in and ask the coaching staff, like, whatever, Toronto wants A, B, and C. Is there anything you guys have to say about it? Or do you ever go for, to bat for players? Or is that just something that comes down to the desk and, and you know somebody's gone and somebody else is coming in? We were, I think, when that trade come down, we were in Montreal. And uh, we were at practice. And Brian Murray came into the coach's room and obviously Doug and him had had some conversation of it earlier that morning. And he said, this is, this is what's happening. Lenny and I were sitting there obviously in, in on the, in, in the same room, but, but you're, you're not, you're not the ones that are going to give the answer, right? You, you trust your scouts and you, you trust what, what the manager's saying. So they just felt they needed some, some different leadership and, and, and you were the ask. There was a couple other names that came up. I'm not quite sure. I think one may have been David Nemirovsky at the time. Um, but obviously Toronto, you were the player Toronto wanted, and, and that's that's how right. it came down. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, in defense of, I mean, Brian Murray. I mean, not for me, but I mean that made that did make your team better in the moment, of course, right? I mean, here's a here's a veteran guy that's playing bigger minutes. You know what I mean, like you, as a, as a coaching staff, I'm sure, and the players as well. I mean, we're excited to, to do that. You want to see GMs making moves to to make you better. So I, I mean, that happens all the time. It's just you. It, it was such a different game back then. Like I don't even think I knew that it was the trade deadline. To be honest, like <laughs> when it happened, like I didn't even. <laughs> nor did I think that I would be a part of it, but. Uh, with you though, and, and the coach, and you said like, maybe, maybe it wasn't for you or whatever, like, and, and some people are great head coaches and maybe not, uh, great assistant coaches. And some people are born to be assistant coaches and not meant to be head coaches. Uh, when you, when you did transfer from the assistant coach role to the head coaching role, um, what, what were like, as far as from the roles and responsibilities, like what, what, what did you feel comfortable with? What wasn't as quite as comfortable for you or where do you feel your strengths were? I think my strengths was. Uh, certainly trying to get to know each, each individual and what, what made them tick, right? And um, there were long hours, like you go in the rink early in the morning and, and cut some video or do some homework on, on previous game or maybe what you had just had to get done in practice, what, what you wanted the players to get out of it. Um, it. It was different as a head coach because I – wanted my staff to once the players started trickling into the dressing room i wanted my staff to do the final preparations for a video session or whatever whatever it might be well i went out and tried to mix with them while they're having coffee or or in the dress room or maybe they're riding the bike or something something like that in the training room where i wanted to get in there and just get a vibe for what the team was thinking and and get to know them better as individuals and and that was my objective. Um, unfortunately, at the time, the other end of the bargain wasn't getting held up back in the assistant coaching room. So then I, I, I was quite overwhelmed with, with all of it. Um, would I do it again, again today? Well, I'm, the opportunity is not going to come again, but I'm finding, I'm finding more enjoyment out of being a, a mentor for different coaching staffs. I was in Budapest, Hungary last year doing it. And I'm doing it with two or three teams in, in the local area here now this year. So That's uh, it's, it's a direction that certain, certainly I felt terrible at the time that I failed more, more, more because of, you know, you, you had your family at home and, and the kids were young and you had to make them understand stand the, the the logic of it all but uh at the end of the day I, I i still think i could be a good assistant coach and and i believe that when i was in that role i, I was i was a really good assistant coach yeah awesome yeah and i testament to that too i mean i thought 
I mean, well, Lind Lindy obviously went on to I me mean, and still in the middle of a crazy successful um, coaching coaching career. But as far as uh, the the coaching staff in in Florida was was very memorable. Like the 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 impact that you and you and Lindy had, especially with the young guys, I think was was great. And that's really probably where where most of the importance really lies. I, well, I shouldn't say most of the importance, but like the, us young guys trying to figure it out, right? You know, I mean, like we you need help, right? You you need guys that want to care about you and and uh and want to invest in you and, and you guys definitely did that I, me I remember that for sure and the coaching staffs are bigger today now jason too right and and, and more each one has more of a, a special role within in the the organization and that coaching staff in florida with doug and lenny and i it, it's kind of what i said earlier where you know doug doug handles the the main focus of of, of day to day but but we also knew the meat and potatoes of, of the franchise going forward were your younger guys. And so that's who we had to, we not had to spend time with. That's who we, we made it number one priority is spend time with right. you guys. When you, I, I just looked at that team that you coach and you mentioned Pavel Bure, who is, I mean, I, I mean, I remember, I remember watching him in Vancouver. I mean, he was electric in a lot of ways and, and he, he was, he, he had his good seasons in Florida as well. I don't know him as a player at all, nor have I talked to anyone who, who played with him. So I don't know anything about, you know, his character, what his personality was like, but, but that, that in that 2000, 2001 year, he had 59 goals and he had 92 points and second place on your team had 37 points. Like, I don't know if I've ever seen a, a, a discrepancy like that before. Like, yeah. How how did how did that come about that that he you know I I know that he was good but it's just so strange that there was no one else there with him at all. Well, it, it was certainly from a lack of depth and and injuries, right? Um, you had to play him, give him a lot of ice time for exactly that reason. There was nobody else in with even close to him as with numbers, so you had to give him the ice time. Um, Pavel was, was, he was a good team player in a lot of ways, but, but he didn't spend a lot of time with his teammates. I think that's a fair way of saying it. And, and there were days when, when his effort and practice wasn't where it had to be. And it, it, it didn't make his teammates very happy. So there, there were times when I, I told the guys, just leave it be, I'll look after it. You know, they were, they were, they were, ready to try and look after the situation by themselves in, in, in a way that probably nobody wanted it to happen. So, right. Um, but with that said, I couldn't take ice time away because you didn't have a chance to win a lot of hockey games. Then, and, and that's just the way it was. And, and you had to accept it that way. Right. Yeah. Isn't that, so you had that, I mean, that, that battle is a big battle. Like when you're, uh when your best player maybe isn't your best locker room guy mm -hmm. right like that's like that's a that's a tough one because you need that you need that group there and that's why i think like the sydney crosbys are so special and again i don't know sydney crosby at all but it's pretty hard to find a guy that says anything bad about sydney crosby you know as a leader or his dedication or anything else so like when you have those guys that are also your hardest working uh, players in practice or in games, like now there's the example, right? And and when there's two different sets of rules and it's very obvious, it's hard to it's hard to get to where you want to go. Yeah, and 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 you're right. Like it, it was it was a, a day to day difficult situation that I had to try and find a balance for because you know you ha you had to have eighteen skaters playing for you, playing hard for you, but then. Then when there was that big of a discrepancy in in, in point them and goal totals that you just you had to you had to play them and and I think at the end of it all, Pavel and Mike were talking behind the scenes and and that was the final straw for me. Right. Hey, um, as a hockey dad, maybe we'll switch gears. Uh, so you you mentioned your son who's played. Uh, you know he's over in Europe now playing. Uh, he's, you know, in, in the middle of his pro journey and, and, you know, you're, you're obviously probably not as, not as involved as you were at the younger ages, but what was, uh, what was it like being a hockey dad through the minor hockey ages, him getting drafted, trying to cut his teeth in the NHL? What was, what was your role there and what type of advice were you giving him? Well, when, when I got fired as head coach in Florida, my wife convinced me to help coach his team as well as, as our two daughters hockey teams. So, um, that was a great experience. Uh, 
days that I wouldn't trade in for anything. Um, in South Florida, we had a lot better program than, than people would think. We, we went to the, the Nationals two years in a row with this team. So, uh, in the U.S., there's 12 teams that go to the Nationals, and, and we were able to accomplish that twice. So that was a big thrill. Um, he's just finished his 10th year pro and, and has retired. He's trying to, to find his way in the officiating way. And, but he played his last four years in Europe. He played 12 NHL games in, in the previous six years, which uh, the numbers were all, always against him. He never was a top kid, but he went through a huge growth spurt. And when he finally got his balance and coordination caught up to him, then, then he, he got ample opportunity. Um, again, never quite made it because of the you know right place, right time thing that we've always spoke about. So um, I, you know what, he, he leaned on me. The kids did lean on me a lot for, for information. I, I tried to support them and I tried to treat you guys in, in a very similar way as if you were my kids where there were times you needed an arm around your shoulders and there was not time you needed to kick an ass. And, and, and that's how I tried to treat you guys in player development and as a coach. But that's how, how I tried to treat our own children. Um, you know, I, I'd watch a game and, and ask him what he thought how he played this and that, and then give him a little insight and, and maybe a different angle to, I wouldn't say pacify him, but to try and lead him in the right direction. And, and um, like I said, much like you, the opportunity just didn't present itself in the right time. And, and so now he's, he's back in Calgary here, living close to us and has, is married and has a nice little, little girl, a year and a half old and they're expecting again. So, it, it's special to have them all close by and, and, and your, your children are younger, but eventually you're going to see them and, and take a lot of pride in how they develop and how they grow up into uh, young adults and, and uh, attempting to find their own career. Yeah, it's tons of fun. I mean, and that is one thing that I'm doing, even with my platform and, and what up my hockey is from, from a philosophical standpoint. And I really believe that hockey can be the best gateway to, manhood you know or to womanhood like to be to be a to be a great person uh and and i think you know all those that you talked about your son maybe growing late i'm sure there is like maybe we can talk about that like there's probably some adversity and and some some hurdles that he had to get through and overcome you know to to maintain uh to maintain his focus on on the goals that he had and you know there's just so much wound up into a team sport and you I mean obviously hockey is our sport but i really do love the aspect of it being team the, the dynamics of the interpersonal and how you show up when things aren't going well for you and, and all these things that i think really um help in the upbringing right of, of our young men, yeah. men and women and uh yeah. and not everyone's going to play in the nhl of course but I, i'm sure i'm sure brody's uh that's your son's name right brody yeah. Yeah. yeah i'm sure brody's a better man because of his you know because of his involvement in, in the sport well, the, the, there were some battles. I, I, I know a lot of scouts and, and hockey people wanted, wanted him to be the similar type player as I was. But because he was, he was 5'7", 120 pounds when he was playing bantam hockey. And uh, we went to Saskatoon Blades camp as an unlisted player. And, and he, he had a really good camp and they wanted to sign him. And I remember Lauren Mulliken saying to me, he was a coach manager, said, promise he looked at my wife and said promise us he's going to grow well he went from <laughs> five seven to six four and a half oh and, wow. and so it took him a while to get it but when he was smaller he had to play more of a cerebral game and think his way through it right so he, he was not a physical guy he he, he did he, he did not avoid one-on-one -on -one puck battles and, and and trench work but at the end of the day he he never became a really physical player. He was more of a cerebral player. And, and I think a lot of hockey people had a different perspective of him than what he really was. And, right. you know, it probably cost him the coach of coach of her of the hurricanes right now was not a fan of him. And, and we all know how Rod, Rod Brendamore played and not what kind of player he was. They weren't the same. They weren't right. the same type of player. So unfortunately yeah. that's how it came down. And, but he is, I, even, I, I, I take great pride in when I work with young kids and, and working with him and, and, and our girls that, you know, you, you try and give them 
information and lead them along the path that'll teach them good life skills. And if you're in any any business or any direction, any path you go in life, you you need you need leadership and you need need to be a good person. And, and I think all three of the kids kids have those qualities. That's awesome. Well, Dwayne, I think we'll wrap it up. I really appreciate your time and uh, for episode 100 to, to speak to with one of my old coaches and to speak with a four-time cup champ on one of the greatest teams to, to ever play is, is, has been an honor. So thanks so much for sharing, sharing your wisdom and your time with us. That's pretty cool for it to be the Century, Century podcast. So thank you, Jason. It's great to cross paths with you again and, and please keep in touch. We will for sure. Thanks so much, Doug. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for staying till the end. Jeez, uh, 100 episodes in the bank. Uh, I was thinking, I was trying to do the math on that. Like, goodness gracious, my episodes, almost none of them have been under an hour. Most of them are over an hour and a half. So an hour and a half, 150 hours of content. Um, that's a lot of talking. My gosh. And for those of you who know me quite well or on a personal level, like I'm... I'm not somebody that controls a conversation or wants to talk a lot. I'm quite an introvert. I'm in my house the vast majority of the time um, by myself, thinking, reading, writing, doing whatever it is that us introverts like to do. Uh, But this podcast has been such an amazing outlet for me to have conversations that inspire me. You know, and hopefully the the conversations that inspire me are also inspiring you. They really seem to like honestly nourish me and feed me. And uh, and one of the common common tendencies for introverts is to forget how much contact with other people actually means to us. Uh, we can kind of get lost in our own thoughts and 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 stuck away in our caves. But uh, this this uh, this platform. And this reason to get in touch with people, to reach out and to have conversations and to ask questions and to share thoughts that actually matter has meant the world to me. And, uh, and by the comments that I'm getting and the reviews that are coming in, it is really making an impact for some of you as well. So uh, I am truly grateful for everyone who wants uh, to be here, who chooses to be here, especially for those of you who choose to listen to the end. Um, very grateful for your support. Uh, grateful that you are inspiring me to continue on this something that something that nourishes me and feeds me and 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 allows me to grow uh, along with you so to all of you who have been here from one to 100 my goodness um, you should earn a prize I wish I knew how to act how to how to know if that's actually happened if, if there's any of you that have listened to all 100 episodes and um, and to celebrate you. If you have and you're still here, my goodness, let me know that you've listened to all 100. I would love to do a shout out uh, to you to recognize to recognize your uh, your longevity and your commitment to, to the show. That would be a super cool uh, thing to discuss. And, and if you have, uh, like I said earlier at the beginning, I, I plan to do a reflection on, on, on my top top episodes in the first 100, which is going to be super hard because all my guests were so amazing. But I think it would be a fun a fun exploration. And and so if you have listened to all of them and you would like to share that with me and also share which ones have been your favorites, I would love, absolutely love to know that. So uh, by all means, share that with me. You can reach me at jason at upmyhockey.com or you can reach out in my contact form on my website, uh, www.upmyhockey.com. I would love to hear from you. So Thanks again for being here, uh, Dwayne. If you're still listening, or anyone who's who's uh, you know close to Dwayne, my goodness, what an amazing uh, conversation that was. Super grateful that he was able to spend time with us. And how can you anyone get tired of the Sutter story? Like you know, from the foundation of hard work and and being farm tough and and boys battling in the in the farm and and jumping hay bales in the field for plyometrics and you know just. I just love everything about it. I mean, I, I love the, the rawness of it, the authenticity of it, and uh, and just a little bit of the traditionalism of it, you know, and, and how we've kind of gotten away into this specialized 12-month-a-year, 24-hour-a-day type approach to to hockey that uh, that I believe we need to be taking a step back from. Uh, I still believe in the multi a multi-sport athlete. I still believe that you need time away from skates. I, I truly believe that for, for not only for younger players, but I also believe that for older players. I, I believe our, our brains need it. I believe our bodies need it. I believe our souls need it. Um, but, uh, but to know that 
you know, the Sutter boys and from Viking Alberta were, were putting the skates away and, and uh, doing their chores in the farm and, and working on working on the person behind the hockey player. You, you, you won't meet somebody that, uh, that'll tell you that a Sutter wasn't a great teammate to them when, when, they, played, when they played with them. And, uh, and I think that's a testament to, to their upbringing, obviously, from mom and dad and, and from also, you know, what they were expected to do and the responsibility of their day-to-day lives and what they were accountable uh, to be and, and being a part of a group, a little team of their own there of the seven boys on the farm. Um, you learn to be a teammate real quick. So I think there's so many lessons there from the, from the, about the Sutters and, and about their name and what they've, uh, how successful they've been not only on the ice but off the ice. So uh, couldn't think of a better guest to have on for episode 100. So thank you so much again for being here. And until next time, play hard. Keep your head up.